Good morning, Tabernacle. Let's stand to our feet and worship this morning. We're going to sing some great hymns of praise out of the hymn, out of the, the, the depths of what Christianity has in this music. Let's sing, To God Be the Glory. Sing with me, church. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son. Shout. 
in him, amen, that we can taste the glory of who he is when we pass from this world. And as we sing and worship this morning, I hope that you'll rest in him, rest in his mercy, rest in his salvation, rest in his spirit. We are washed in his blood and made clean. Sing with me, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. that that's your story, trusting in Jesus and praising him this morning. We can't sing some of the greatest hymns of all time without this being the crux of our belief. That no matter what happens in this world, no matter what pain and sorrow that we deal with, that our God says it is well with our souls. This world has a ton of weight against us, amen. But when we trust in Jesus, when we give him everything in our hearts, when we submit to his calling and his mercy and his grace, we can say, 
it is well with our souls. Amen. Let's sing this great hymn together.
Let's sing that together. Let's sing that together. It is well. It is well. With my soul, Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we are yours and you are ours. And we thank you that we can wake up in the midst of turmoil and pain and sorrow and know that it is well with our souls, that our joy comes from you and you alone, that our strength and our passion and our love and our grace and our mercy comes from you and you alone. As we enter into this season in our yearly calendar where we are reminded of your sacrifice, we know, God, that every morning and every breath we take is because of that sacrifice. Every morning we wake up, we should be thinking about the price you paid on that cross of shedding your blood for us so that we can be resurrected in your name from the ashes of sin and death. And next Sunday we will celebrate that, but God... We should be celebrating that with every breath we take. We love you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done in our lives. And God, we thank you for your, your grace and your mercy and the pain that you sacrificed and bore on that cross for us. For in the midst of that pain and that sorrow that you suffered, we do not have to suffer eternal death. We get to live with you forever in a joy unmatched. Thank you for allowing us the privilege of saying it is well with our souls as we grow close to you. It is in your name we pray this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Tabernacle. How are you? Hey, wasn't that good singing? Yeah. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Oh, yeah. Did anybody notice that Miss Susan was playing something new up here on stage? Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. I want to tell you what I'm most thankful about uh, the new, you know, in Kentucky, that's a piano, right? Oh, yeah. uh, the thing I'm most thankful about is that it weighs 277 pounds because the old one weighed 2,077 pounds. Uh, but yeah, yeah, didn't Miss Susan do a good job? Give her a round of applause. I know she doesn't want that, but she is faithful. And uh, we just are so thankful for her. Hey, if you've got a book, or a book, the book this morning, turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. As you're turning there, I'm trying to find my notes. Here they are. Now, I had a lady in my very first church who every once in a while would steal my notes out of my Bible. I'm not making that up, am I, Jenny? Because she said I preach better without them, so. I don't know really what to make of that. <laughs> It is our last Sunday here in the gymnasium. I've got to be honest, it's a little bittersweet. Uh, I, I am looking forward to having our Easter service in our newly renovated 
uh, not sanctuary, but just the renovated stage. Uh, but at the same time, I think I'm going to miss being in here close with you, uh, singing and worshiping. I told somebody this morning, it's really a lot easier for me to get around to see people because you're all in one spot. And, um, and so I'm going to miss it a little bit, but I am going to be thankful. Uh, I, I, just one thing I want you to put on your calendar. How many of you own either a vacuum cleaner or a box of rags? On Tuesday morning, we're going to be cleaning because we want we got company coming on Easter, right? We want our sanctuary to be clean, a lot of dust, a lot of debris. Uh, we've been cleaning along the way, but it needs a good, thorough, central Illinois deep clean. About 9 o'clock, if you guys want to show up, uh, we are going to do a deep clean. I'm going to put Rick Borderwick in charge of that. He doesn't know that. Rick, you're in charge. Where, where are you, Rick? He left. He, he, didn't want to, he knew that was coming. Um, but any, anyway, uh, Tuesday, 9 o'clock, we're going to be uh, hopefully getting the, the deep clean done. I want to just take a moment and thank every single person who has volunteered during this, whether you have done nothing but run a vacuum sweeper or a mop or you've hauled material in. Some of you have been ma doing construction on, on our new reception area. Some of you have been doing construction on the sound booth. Uh, we have a new live stream sound booth that, that is better than anything they've got in Nashville, Tennessee. It is fantastic. Uh, and so it, they even said that they would make, it would make my sermons better yes. going out on the internet. Um, some, that was my wife. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we've got, we've got, we're going to have new crow's nests uh, for the for the cameramen. If y'all don't remember, for the last seven or eight years, the cameramen in our sanctuary have literally been climbing up on a pew onto a piece of plywood that was laid across a couple of pews. OSHA was really happy about that, and um, but we made some really nice permanent pews the stage looks great we're going to have a new piano some new lighting um i'm missing some things too but all you people who have just come together I, I have been so blessed to watch you come together to make this happen and here's what i know tabernacle baptist church is in my opinion the greatest church on the face of the earth i believe that thank you thank you thank you but we're great because we've got a great savior and so let's talk about that today. As we are entering what we would call Passion Week, or today would be Palm Sunday, the Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem to start the week leading up to his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, I want to talk about what Passover meant. They were in Jerusalem celebrating this feast called the Passover, celebrating this festival called the Passover. That was instituted by God in Exodus chapter 12. Do you remember the scenario that was going on? Um, Israel, the, the Hebrew people, were slaves down in Egypt. Do you all remember that? They had become slaves for over 400 years. And they finally were crying out to God and saying, God, would you deliver us from these evil taskmasters, the Pharaoh? And so, God sent them a deliverer. His name was Moses. And Pharaoh would not let the children of Israel go. He used them as literally slave labor to build things. Um, and so, as, as they were trapped under this horrible regime, God sent plagues upon the land of Egypt. And man, the, some of these plagues were crazy. They were the water turned into blood. Could you imagine that? Go and turn on the faucet, trying to wash the dishes, and the next thing you know, it's just blood filling the sink up. Or go down to the well, Brother Cooprider, draw you up a cold glass of water out of the bottom of the well, and it's a cup of blood. Or how about this? Every time there was one plague that every time they opened the, 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 the cabinet to the kitchen that there were frogs in the dishes, frogs in 
in the well, frogs under the bed, frogs in the closet. There was a plague of frogs. I like frog legs, but I'm telling you, that would get old. Plagues of flies, plagues of different sorts. None of those plagues ever turned Pharaoh's heart to where he would let God's people free. And so God in the last plague said this. He said, if you don't let my people go, he said, I'm going to send a death angel to kill all of the firstborn, not just of the families, but I'm going to kill the firstborn of all of the livestock. And now you would think that God, who had done all these plagues and accomplished them, who that Pharaoh would have looked at him and said, okay, this is kind of something I'm taking seriously, but evidently Pharaoh didn't. Pharaoh said, well, if God thinks he can kill all the firstborn of both every family and of all the livestock, just let him. And so God sent a word to the children of Israel. And here's what he said. He said, I'm going to send the death angel over all the land of Egypt, which they were in, by the way. He said, here's what I want you to do. Exodus chapter 12 takes this. He says, I want you to take a lamb, and I want you to bring it into the house. Let's just read that. Chapter 12. Starting in verse 2. This month is the beginning of the months for you. It is the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, that they must each select an animal of the flock according to their families, to their father's family, one animal per family. And if the household is too small for an animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. And you should apportion the animal according to eat what each will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats, and you are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. And they must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. And they are to eat the meat that night, and they should eat it roasted over a fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roasted over fire, its head as well as its legs and its inner organs. And you must not leave any of it until morning. Any part of it left until morning must burn. Here is how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. Could you imagine this? They've never heard anything like this before. God's already calling this the Passover. They don't even know what a Passover is. And then in verse 12, he says this, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both the people and the animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you where I, when I strike the land of Egypt. And so God told the children of Israel, there is a plague coming, and it is a plague of death. And the way that you avert this plague of death is you have to take this little lamb or this little goat and you bring it into your house on the 10th day of the month, and then from the 10th day of the month to the 14th day of the month, you let this little lamb or this little goat be in the house with you. Think about that for a second. Oh, there's nothing cuter than a little lamb. Man, have you ever seen a little lamb jump? They can jump this high. 
if you want to see something cute, did I say cute from the pulpit? If you want to see something cute, go to YouTube and Google baby goats. They're the cutest thing in the world. They jump and kick and buck and roll and do all kinds of stuff. It's just wonderful. Could you imagine falling in love with that little baby lamb, that little baby goat over about a period of four days? But then there's something that happens. On the 14th day, just about twilight, when it starts to get dark, you're to take that little goat out and according to the law, kill it. Slice its throat, let its blood pour into a basin. Then you're to take that little baby goat, that little baby lamb, roast it over an open fire, sit around the table. You and your family are to eat the broken body of that lamb. Are y'all starting to hear some symbolism here? And then you take that blood that's in that bowl, and he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a death angel, and it's going to literally fly over the land of Egypt. In every place where there is a, a firstborn child, it is going to kill that firstborn child. Unless the blood of that lamb that you've just eaten, you took a swab and you swabbed both the doorposts and the transom or the lintel over top of the door. And if the death angel comes and he's flying over top and he sees the blood that's been applied to the doorpost of the house, he'll pass over that house and there will be no harm come to the firstborn. And so here's what we find out later in chapter 12. That God is a God of promises. And he kept his promise. His promise was that, that he would do this thing, this plague, and it happened. Turn over to chapter, or the same chapter, but verse 29. It says, now about midnight. The Lord struck every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the livestock. And during the night, Pharaoh got up along with all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt because there was a house. There wasn't a house without someone dead. He summoned Moses and Aaron during the night and said, get out immediately from among my people. Why do you think God had them eat the Passover in their traveling clothes? That's what it said. He knew what was going to happen. And he summoned Moses and Aaron and said, get out immediately. Go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go and worship the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you had already asked me, and leave and bless me. And I love this, by the way, when you follow God and you're in a bad situation and you follow him anyway, God's going to bless your socks off. Listen to what it says. Now the Egyptians pressured the people in order to send them out quickly of the country, for they said, we are all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, <coughs> and with their kneading bowls wrapped up their claws. And then it says in verse 35, that the people in Egypt actually gave them anything that they wanted just to get them out. And it says that they literally came through and pilfered <laughs> all of the things that Egypt had as they left. Great wealth left with them. What are you talking about, preacher? In this time period, God set up the festival of Passover. It was to remember what God had done in this great horrendous event about how he delivered his people. He delivered his people out of oppression from Pharaoh, but he also delivered his people from death. And it, if you continue to read in chapter 13, it says that the reason why that this was taking place, that this festival that was taking place during the Passover week is because God said that this is a permanent thing that you are to do is to remember the Passover. Every year, they came together and they remembered the Passover. Now, 
there's about three things you've got to understand here. First is this. The, the institution of the Passover happened whenever Pharaoh refused and God sent the plague. But then there's the Passover festival that occurred every single year up until Jesus came. It still happens now, but when Jesus came, he was the type and he typified The Passover typified Jesus. It was a shadow of what Jesus was getting ready to do on the Passover. So there's three things here. There is what happened in Egypt. There is the institution of the festival. But then the festival is, is really what is foreshadowing what Jesus is coming to do on the cross. Are you all with me? Isn't it amazing how God in his providence has made this happen? It's almost like God knew what was going to happen. Oh, by the way, I, I think I read somewhere in the book of Revelation where it said Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God was weaving all this together. But in this story, the key phrase is the key is, is the idea of deliverance. God's people were delivered. They were delivered from Pharaoh. They were delivered from death. And now Jesus has come in Matthew chapter 26, the start of Passover in his day to show that all people of all time can be delivered both from oppression of sin and be delivered from death. And so what we have here is we have a picture of what Jesus came to do. I, I want to run three things by you really quick. Man, I, Scott, you're going to have to make those bigger on there. I can't see what time it is. I guess I'll just have to preach longer. I guarantee in less than 30 seconds, they'll be the full screen. <laughs> I want to talk to you this morning about deliverance. Listen, God's deliverance from sin and death, from bondage and death, always involves substitution. There has to be a substitution in order for there to be a deliverance. When you look at the Old Testament and you look at G in, the, in, in, in the plague, and then you look at Jesus, listen, there, there was a lamb, and his death was a substitute for that of the firstborn son. Anywhere that did not have a lamb that was killed and the blood on the doorpost and the lintel of the house, that son died. Therefore, the, the lamb was a substitute for that death. This was the only way. There was no other way to, or to escape the plague except by God's provision of a Passover lamb. There had to be a substitute in order for your son not to die. It was inescapable. It was horrific. It was absolutely devastating. This plague knew nothing about class. It knew nothing about power. It knew nothing about wealth or fame or prestige. It did not differentiate between peasant, pauper, or potentate. It was Pharaoh, even the greatest king in the entire world, his son died. You know, earlier, whenever there was a mass exodus of children, Pharaoh missed one. Y'all remember that story? The Hebrews got to plentiful and pharaoh said well let's go kill some and they missed one do you remember what his name was moses he missed at least one but god didn't miss a single one from the palace to the prison to the pig pen there was not a single one that god missed and yet the only way to escape this horrible thing was by a substitute. Can I tell you this morning that if you're saved, or you are law, you're saved by a substitute. And if you're lost and you need to be saved, there's nothing that you can do yourself. It takes a substitute for you to be saved. 
You see, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, when he went to, to the cross, he took the full punishment of God's wrath for you. Every sin that you've ever committed, everything that you've ever done that offended the Lord God, Jesus, in a matter of hours, paid for that sin. Think about that. You know, I remember growing up, <laughs> I remember growing up and I would get in trouble. And for some reason, because I was the oldest, whenever the other cousins were around, I got in trouble when they did dumb stuff. Anybody else remember that? Go out on the creek when the ice is frozen over and they fall through and I'm completely dry and I get, I would like to say three licks, but it's probably more like 10. Why? Because you're the oldest, you're the substitute. Can I tell you something? This morning, if you're under the sound of my voice and you're lost, and you've been trying to work out your salvation through what you do, you need to understand that there is no amount of work that you can perform that's in the spiritual realm that will ever cause you to be right with God. What you need is a holy substitute. You need to take all of your sins and by faith, Tell God that you want to see them put on the cross. And by the way, he's already done this. And believe that God has, God has put your sins on the Lord Jesus and paid for those sins. The same way that I paid for my little cousin's mistakes, Jesus has paid for yours. Think about that for a second. He was a substitute. That little lamb was a substitute. Man. Man. But God's deliverance not only, not only always involves a substitute, but God's deliverance also involves separation. It always involves separation. The Passover was God separating the Hebrews from Egypt. He was cutting off all that had rule and power over them. He annihilated a generation of firstborn men. And just as Pharaoh had done this to the Hebrews... God did it to sever them from the grips of slavery. God was separating them from something, but he was also separating them to something. Can I tell you that when God delivers you through the substitute of the Lord Jesus Christ, he delivers you from the power of sin that once held you captive, but he's also delivering you unto himself, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he delivers you to a life that is greater and better than anything you could ever imagine. There's a lot of people who believe this. They believe that they can accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior, but not take him as Lord. They believe that he can save them from their sins and save them from the fires of hell, but they do not have to live godly. Can I tell you that when God separates you from sin and he delivers you unto a new life, the power of the Spirit of God so indwells you that you cannot live the way you used to. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 36 says that we are once had a heart of stone, but now we have a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36 also says that the Spirit of God now works in us and causes us to walk in God's statutes. If the Spirit of God lives in you, you will walk the way that God has caused you to walk, called you to walk. There is a separation there. And so some of us believe this, that we got saved maybe when we were a little kid. And yet it caused no distinct change in our life to cause us to walk in holiness. God separated the Hebrews from the Egyptians. And through the blood of Jesus, he's separating you from the power of sin and death. Now, does that mean Christians don't fall or Christians can't sin? Absolutely not. But according to the book of 1 John, you can't continue to do it and not be convicted by the Spirit of God. You can't live in sin happily. 
You can't. And so God in his deliverance always involves a substitution and it always involves separation. Ask yourself the question. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says this, examine yourself to see that you be in the faith. Is my life the way that I live? Am I happy in my sin? Can I continue to live in my sin and be okay? If you can, there's a cause for concern according to the scripture. God's deliverance always involves a sacrifice. So it involves a substitute, it involves separation, but it also involves a sacrifice. There was a lamb that was slain. He was slain in a specific way. He was chosen on the 10th day of Nisan, the month, and slain on the 14th. It was a particular kind of lamb or goat, a year old, but not more than a year old. It had to be perfectly unblemished. Do you realize that God has said that when he wants to deliver people from their sins, they have to come a specific way. Y'all let me preach just a minute. Listen to this, guys. I, I want you to hear your pastor say this. Everyone's testimony is different. But everyone's testimony is also the same. Everyone's testimony about how they got saved is different. But everyone's testimony about how they got saved is also the same. Well, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. There may be different circumstances surrounding your testimonies about how God saved you. But there are some key things some specific things in your testimony that have to be there in order for it to be valid and true. See, what do you mean? If your testimony does not include conviction of the Holy Spirit, where you, you were at one point in your life convicted over your lostness and convicted of your sins, if your testimony does not include repentance, where you turned away from your sins, if your testimony does not also include faith, where you believe that Jesus was the Son of God and he was the perfect sacrifice for your sins, and it does not include separation, that the Spirit of God worked in you to make you something new and different and separate you from what you once were, I need you to understand that those things have to be in a testimony for it to be valid and true. Because God saves sinners the same way. Through repentance, conviction of sins, repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, our testimonies can look different. There may be some of you who were into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And God saved you out of that lifestyle. And your testimony is going to look different than the sweet little church girl who sat on the front pew and listened to Every Sunday is the preacher preached, and she didn't really get into that much stuff, but man, she was still a sinner. You might have been a gangbanger, or you might have been a bank teller. But let me tell you what is not good. I, I hear a lot of times testimonies, people say, hey, tell me when you got saved, and, and their testimony probably goes something like this. Well, I was... This is actual legitimate testimony people have given me before. I was driving down the road one night, and I'd had a hard day at work, and I looked up through the windshield, and I saw a flash of light in the sky, and I just knew I was going to be okay. I'm going to tell you something. I'd hate to step out into eternity with a testimony like that. <laughs> I've told this one before, but there's a guy going in for heart surgery. Here's what he said. He said, I knew that I had this big thing coming up and I didn't know what to do and I was a little concerned about my life and preacher, I'm okay because here's what I did. I went behind the barn and I drove a tomato steak in the ground and I told the Lord right there, that's where I'm laying it down. Laying what down? He said, I, I don't know. I'm just laying it down. Tomato steak? Again, I'd hate to step out into, into eternity with a testimony like that. 
See, God saves people in a very specific way. He saves them through the sacrifice of his son. He sends the Spirit of God to cause you to be afraid for your sins. To have a fear that's holy of God. To tremble before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who literally holds your life in the balance. He, he sends conviction from the Spirit. And then through that, you repent of your sins and trust in Christ. And God makes you a new creature. It's a very specific thing, even though the circumstances may look different. In the same way that there was a specific plan for the Lamb in the Old Testament. Guys, this Passover lamb in the Old Testament typifies Jesus and what he was going to come and do. Listen, Jesus, this is so unbelievable. It's not like I said before, it's almost like God planned it. The lamb was chosen on the 10th day of Nisan and slain on the 14th day of Nisan. The Passover lamb, Jesus, entered Jerusalem, guess when? The 10th day and he was crucified on the 14th day. He had delivered us from our sins by substitution. He took God's wrath in our place. He delivered us by separation. He separated us from the world and is separating us unto righteousness. He delivered us by becoming a blood sacrifice the same way that the lamb was a blood sacrifice. He gave himself up like a lamb led to the slaughter. Romans 3, 25 says this, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. What God did in the Old Testament just typified and foreshadowed what Jesus was coming to do for you 2,000 years ago. During this Passover, 2022, I want you to understand something. That in the first Passover, every Hebrew house had to apply the blood of the slain lamb to the doorposts and the lintels of their house. The sacrifice of the lamb, I want you to hear this sentence. Everybody listen to me. That, that was really suave, wasn't it? Seriously, everybody listen to me. If you're lost this morning, if you don't know Jesus this morning, if you know that you stepped out into eternity, I want you to hear this. that they had to apply the blood of the lamb to their doorposts. The sacrifice of the lamb alone benefited the family nothing without the proper application. Without the proper application of the sacrifice that they had made, they would have still endured the agony of the plague which God placed upon Egypt. Jesus died like a sacrifice for the sins of the world. However, like in the Passover, not everyone is automatically benefited by the sacrifice. Unless you repent of your sins and believe in the good news of Jesus, which is that Jesus died in your place and thereby has taken the penalty of God's wrath for you, which you deserve, the sacrifice of Jesus is not applied to the doorpost and lintel of your heart. If you're here this morning under the sound of my voice, you need to understand that God, from before the foundation of the world, has set his eye of affection on you. God has loved you. So much so that he set up this whole long thing to be a foreshadowing and a type so that you might understand that he sent his perfect son as a sacrifice. And you don't physically do this, but you in a spiritual way through repentance and faith, take the blood of Jesus and apply it to the doorpost of your heart and the lintel of your heart so that one day, whenever the death angel passes over you, you will not die. You know, in the book of John, it says that the believer never dies. He never experiences the sting of death. Yes, this earthly shell, this body, this as my good friend Roger says, this earth suit. 
It may pass away, but you never die. And you never experience the pain of death because you've applied the blood of Jesus to your heart. Can I tell you what my heart is this morning as your pastor? If you can't see the passion this morning, my heart is this. Is that no one in this room would step out into eternity and let the death angel pass over them and not have the blood of Jesus applied to their heart. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you're lost this morning, if the Spirit of God is convicting you this morning, if you know that you died and you would step out into eternity this morning, I'm I'm here to tell you that the bowl of Jesus' blood is here and ready to be applied to your heart if you'll just simply repent of your sins and trust in Christ. If you'll come to the foot of the cross and kneel down in humility and say, I can't do this, I can't work enough, I can't get enough graces from God on my own, but I want to apply this precious blood to my heart and to my life. I want you to know that God will save you this morning. I beg with you, I plead with you, I admonish you this morning. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another day. God has literally taken this lamb of heaven. And he's let you see through the lens of the scripture how beautiful he was. How wonderful he was. How compassionate he was. How loving he was, how caring he was. And if you'll read through the Gospels, you'll see, just like those people had that little lamb in their house, you'll get to love and know Jesus. And then God took this perfect sacrifice, this perfect lamb of God, and hung him on a cross where his blood flowed down the wooden beams in his feet and splattered on the ground all around it. And he was literally having his blood poured out for you. Oh, to reject such an offering. To reject such a sacrifice. I don't understand how you could. This morning, I want to invite you if you're lost. If you need the Savior... The first thing that you have to get over is this. What everybody else is thinking about you. I'm going to ask you guys to stand, and as they're coming, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I don't know how they're going to do that, but I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about a man that I know that I probably haven't seen in 20 plus years. Brother Michael Jacobs was a rough, still is, rough, old country preacher. Started in an independent fundamental Baptist church. You got to understand that a lot of times in the IFB churches, if they want to go start a new work or a new mission, they don't have a mission board to go to. They have to go around to all these different churches. And they'll, they'll ask for finances, and people will start to finance them. And so one day, Preacher Mike was sitting on the front row in his church, his church. They were having a camp meeting. And there were all these men there, these pastors of these other churches that supported him financially. He realized under the preaching of God's word that even as a pastor, he'd not been saved. He was just playing games with God. And as he sat there in the front row under conviction of the Holy Spirit that he needed to be saved, with all these men who were supporting his ministry and supporting this church beside me, beside him, he was having a battle in his mind. The battle was, Lord, what what am I doing here? 
I can't go forward. All these people think I'm saved. They think, they think I'm somebody. I've grown this church from just four or five people to a hundred. These men, they pay my salary. These men, they, their churches have confidence in me. And the devil the whole time was fighting him. And finally, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I love this phrase. He was so under conviction. He looked around at all the things that were there. His church and those men that were supporting him and what everybody thought. And here's the phrase he said. I'm not going to hell for anybody. I'm not going to hell for anything. In other words, here's what he was saying. I don't care what these people think. The most important thing in my life right now is to get right with Jesus. The most important thing in my life right now is to give my life to God. And we're just going to let everything else fall where it may. Can I tell you something? The Bible says in order for you to gain your life, you've got to what? Lose it. There's some of you here this morning under the sound of my voice who need to quit worrying about what everybody else thinks, who need to quit worrying about what you believe other people's responses are. You've got to quit worrying about what you think people are going to think about you, no matter what position you hold, no matter how long you've been coming to church, no matter where you're at. And you've got to come to this altar this morning and lose your life so that you can gain what God has for you. There may be some of you this morning who've got family members that you know are lost. You need to come to this altar this morning and you need to pray for them. You need to get them here for Easter. You need to get them here to this church. You need to get them under the sound of the gospel. You come this morning too. You got to do business with God. You just come this morning in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you'd bless this time together. Lord, help us now as we, as we see you do your work. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. If you need to come, flood this altar. You come now. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love.
You may be seated. Hey, good morning, church. As we continue our time of response, we want to get ready to just uh, lead us in a time of praying for our offering. But first of all, uh, we want to make sure to welcome any guests who may be here worshiping with us today. If you are a guest, we are extremely excited and privileged to have you here worshiping with us today. Uh, our pastor, Pastor Carlton, would love to introduce himself to you and maybe share with you or answer a couple questions that you may have about the ministry of Tabernacle Baptist Church. The best way for that to happen is to head right outside of those doors. Uh, him and his wife, Jenny, will be out in an area that we call Take Five, five minutes with the pastor, uh, just to know a little bit more about him, a little bit more about the life of the church, and maybe how we can minister to you. Uh, also, as we get ready to take the offering, this morning I was just reminded, thank you through Corinthians chapter 2, or 2 Corinthians, uh, offering gets to be normal. It gets to be something that's a rhythm. I have to come up here every week and try to give you guys something fresh to remind you of what we're actually doing. And uh, 2 Corinthians tells us that it's a, a joy to give back to the Lord. And, and there, it reminded me of the fact that what the scriptures tell us is as Jesus got ready to lay down his life, he counted it as a joy to lay his life down for us. So many times, I can do it myself, we get in the habit and we even consider it a bill or something that's regular or just a routine to say, I'm gonna give back a portion of what God has given to me so that see the kingdom grow. Guys, this morning, don't see it as a habit. If it's been a habit for you, remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, what we're gonna remember what he did for us here this week. Remember what we're called to do is sacrifice just a portion of what he has given for us, reminding us that the greatest gift of generosity is what he did for us at the cross. You guys, this morning, be generous. If you're struggling with generosity, don't give. Get ready for your heart to be right to give, then give in however a way God is calling you to do that. There's a couple different ways you can do that. You got the, uh, the boxes as you exit, obviously, uh, but also online, tpc.church is a way for you to give online. But no matter how you get, give uh, through practically, make sure our hearts are right and giving back, remembering the greatest gift of generosity, what Jesus did for our sins. God, we thank you for that gift. God, I pray that uh, whatever is given today, you utilize that in order to take the name of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. God, we so desperately need your love. We, we often think of the things that we need, but truly, God, what we need is to be connected with you, to be reunited with you, to see people who are in a broken relationship, separated from you, brought to you through the blood of Jesus. God, I pray that you use these gifts in order to do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Tabernacle. I'm Stephen, and here are your announcements. Coming up Sunday, April 24th, is Bagels and the Bible. This is a joint Sunday school class where all adult Sunday school classes will meet in the Family Life Center at 9 a.m. Session three, a family discipleship night, begins Wednesday, April 20th at 6 p.m. Featured classes include Biblical Leadership with Dr. Fran, How to Avoid a Purposeless Life with Amy Richards, and the Big Picture New Testament Survey with Richard McKeerahan. Next Sunday, April 17th, is Resurrection Sunday. Come and celebrate our risen King, and be sure to invite anyone who needs to meet our risen King. The Tabernacle Music Ministry is putting together an amazing program that will magnify Jesus. The service begins at 1030 in the newly renovated auditorium. Next Saturday, April 16th, is Extravaganza! There will be games, egg hunts, food, bounce houses, yard games, and more. Be sure to pick up an egg invitation and invite a family today. This Wednesday is Operation Saturation at 6 p.m. We will outreach to our neighbors in the Megan DeMoffitt neighborhood and invite them to join us for Egg Strav and Resurrection Sunday. Oh, oh. And coming up. Today, following the service, there's an extra egg packing party in the loft. Music, food, and fun will be provided. Thank you for joining us this morning, Tabernacle. You will find all of this information and more on the church website, the bulletin, and all of the social media and video platforms. Have a great rest of your Sunday.
Stephen, were those the ones that you spit out that you ate at the end? <laughs> Have you had a glorious time in the house of the Lord this morning? Just, this is so exciting. And I want to tell you that Easter morning is, is a time for us to celebrate the resurrection of our Christ. And, and I want you to know that we are going to have seven baptisms on Easter morning next week. There is so much to look forward to for next week. Prepare your hearts and your mind for worship and invite somebody to come with you to Tabernacle next week. Can you do that? All right, let's stand to our feet as we dismiss. Heavenly Father, we felt you move in this place this morning as we sang our worship to you, as we worshiped, as we studied scripture, as we worshiped, as we prayed and praised your name. God, I pray that our words were sweet to your ears this morning, as you are worthy of all of our praise. Send us out to be a light into this community. Help us to come back next week with hearts and minds and souls prepared to give all that we have for you because you gave the greatest sacrifice for us. We thank you for this morning and for this church and for your people and for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.